Thank you all for coming. Um, my name's Jo Lane. I have some works in this show, Drawing Strength. I've curated the inclusions into this drawing show. Um, Jeanette Davidson is the arts manager here at Montsalvat and has been incredibly encouraging for this show and its development. And I just want to thank you, thank you all for coming and the traditional owners of the land that we sit on. Yes, they are draw beautifully too. Um, I called this talk that, <laughs> um, and it's for a particular reason, and I hope that that becomes evident. I also just want to apologise. It's going to be a little bit wordy at the beginning. I just want to do a bit of twinkling thinking uh, before we get into images. And of course, the best images are always the real images in situ. So it's not a huge image-oriented PowerPoint just at the beginning. <coughs> Thank you for lots of women coming today. I was really encouraged that so many people uh, booked to hear this. It's just a wonderful thing as a drawer and a lover of drawing. Um, without a minute's hesitation, in wishing to study uh, a master's in fine art, I wanted it to specialise in drawing. I didn't know how many masters around the world did that, and there are very few. When I did do the masters, and I'll tell you about that in a minute, I learnt a lot more than just about drawing. What I did discover was a deeper world of human communication, perception, production and thinking. And in the university context that I undertook the degree in, um, the articulation and analysis of drawing was very, very deep. Part of the handbook for the Masters of Drawing at UAL, which is University of Arts London, <coughs> and that's made up actually of six universities, Chelsea, Central St. Martins, Camberwell, London School of Communication, London School of Fashion, um, and um, Wimbledon, <laughs> Wimbledon Arts College, which is where the Masters of Drawing was, was undertaken. This is what the uh, handbook says. The drawings that you make on the MA drawing course will expand the question of what a drawing might be and chart the evolution of your thinking. Drawing has traditionally been valued for its ability to document the world, for posterity and to articulate space in the preparations of art and design, etc. Since the invention of photography brought the conventional utilities of drawing into question, research has addressed the boundaries of what a drawing is. The resultant definitions now readily accept that walking, writing, dancing, or a mere gesture can constitute a drawing. <clears throat> they go on to say, drawings are not simply something to look at. They are a direct form of primary communication that should be recognised as a functional part of our literacy. Part of the reason is that drawn lines convey an idea with such immediacy that drawing belongs to everyone. Acts of drawing occur all the time. Someone applying eyeliner, doodling while on the phone, signing your name, or making someone a map on the back of an envelope. These are cursive activities that we habitually engage in. We are all art mark makers. This course, with the assumption that drawings have their own visual reality, thought and experience, that can be made readable. That's the end of the course context <laughs> now. This uh, talk now is going to be my take on what I would love to convey. I know that this show does do that, but I will broaden here. Drawing is as profoundly embedded in the history, in history, as it is in the present. Distinct from other artistic practices, drawing is not solely related to the art world, both as act, actually, and artefact but belongs equally to engineering, architecture, design, science, music, etc. In fact, drawing relates to every possible area of creative and communicative endeavour that involves thinking and making. 
to everyone who ever picked up a pencil to sketch out an idea. As Deanna Petheridge in The Primacy of Drawing, which was an extraordinary exhibition and it has been a wonderful book which I didn't carry back with me from London, um, in art, even though the relationship of drawing to other forms of visual practice has radically changed in the last decades, sketching continues to be identified with the invention of new ideas. With the recording of or response to the external physical world, as well as constituting private signs of subjective and emotive creative self. She said that in 2010. I'm going to show you some examples. <clears throat> this is Frank Gehry's first sketch. Have we got the right picture? Yep. First sketch for what is now the Louis Vuitton Foundation, which was built in 2006, building, which of course is filled with art. Um, and this drawing and many others of his are everywhere in the building. He imagined it when he was commissioned, he sketched it and this process started it. He wanted the building itself to have natural movement. So starting with a sketched idea was ideal uh, in this case. These sketches drove the design process, but, but I actually look at that and I see a beautiful drawing. To me it blooms so much simplicity and joy and confidence yet roughness. That is actually the mark, uh, the marquette that was made, one of them uh, for the building from his drawings and that's a photo that I took of it reaching out uh, over the park in Paris and I have to say if you're ever in Paris you've just got to go there. <laughs> Jeanette and I went there together, it's just astounding. It's a building that floats but is solid and it's an extraordinary, and the drawing started it. <clears throat> Look, I threw uh, that in because, of course, many industries use drawing as a tool towards something else, um, as has been noted. Fashion designers, psychiatrists, architects, thinkers, mappers. Uh, this particular page is about my personal conclusion of what landscape painting is. The arrow is being the main drawing because I worked out that every landscape painting is in fact a painting of the earth from the human context just little bits of drawing that um, are used for, for other purposes. These are sketches done by, um, with patients by uh, Professor Donald Winnicott, a psychoanalyst in UK. He famously uses doodling. He commences interaction with children uh, with problems to break down difficulties in communications. He uses this squiggle game with his young patients to try and understand their conflicts. Uh, the one that's on the podium there, he has a story where the little boy, he drew the squiggle and asked the little boy to add a bit more and then the little boy added the podium and Dr. Winnicott added the shadow and then they suddenly had this laugh, that this sense of humour that this boy turned his squiggle into a, into a uh, sculpture and there the, 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 the break was broken and they could um, have this communication. So drawing can be used for all sorts of reasons. Fashion designers, of course, draw everything. This is um, a map. This is one of the earliest forms of drawing, actually, apart from cave and man's um, drawings prior to paper. Uh, mapping is the earliest, uh, one of the earliest forms. This is actually a map drawn by Thomas Pride in 1789, and it's an old estate map, and this is actually the ancestral home of uh, Winston Churchill. And again, I see that as a beautiful image, not just a map of a place. It can mean many things now, mapping. Uh, one can map how one feels in a drawing. The two, the two text pieces over there on either side of the corner, they are actually maps of relationships. Uh, one is mother and son, their text um, interchange that they had, they're quite banal, but to the artist she was making a drawing of a relationship and in fact her husband is a record producer and they decided that of course it looked then like a sound wave. So there's many ways to draw in mapping, it doesn't have to be a place. We navigate our world through maps. Um, another important inclusion in anything about drawing is uh, botanical. Uh, both Fiona McKinnon and Catherine Pilgrim's works here um, had to be included because part of documenting the real world also means 
that it's the nature that we look at and to connect. And scientists are well known to want a drawing of a plant or a creature or a vein or a heart by an artist more than a photograph to study from. A dissection will always contain more information than a camera ever can. I also think that the two works here that are included elevate uh, way beyond technical drawings. Okay, I know it sounds odd, but I'm now going to go into a little bit more theorising about drawing. What is drawing? Here's a little drawing that changed the way the world saw a huge scientific theory. Rather than show cave drawings and early drawings, I find this to be one of the most incredible simple drawings about a complex species, complex thought, problem solving, logic, etc. This is Charles Darwin's first note into the real world of his thinking around evolution. He called it a sketch for the evolutionary tree in 1870. And at the top he writes, I think. That is the very first piece into the real world of his understanding of evolution. Tanya Kovats, who was a course leader during my course, she wrote in the drawing book, I brought some books if anyone wants to see later, this drawing has reliance on analogy. Families are not trees, after all. And it shows a capacity to think in metaphor and to abstract in drawing. Holding a pencil between two fingers and a prehensile thumb, humans draw extraordinary things. They think of it and draw it. Another story I have heard is that he was afraid to write it down because he thought the church might see it and be angry at his evolutionary theory. But he wanted it recorded. So honest are children's drawings of their world. This drawing was admissible in court as a truthful document. This is a drawing by a child in Darfur in Sudan. 500 such drawings were submitted to the ICC, the International Criminal Court, as evidence in a 2007 prosecution. And because of these drawings, the convictions were upheld. Drawing can speak an unspeakable truth. A few more words now, sorry. <laughs> uh, many thinkers have articulated the notion of drawing, articulated and argued, and it goes on arguing. I've got no idea why it's so discussed, uh, more so, I think, than painting and sculpting, I suspect. Somehow one can draw in paint, but one can't paint in drawing. The drawing at the back there, I call that a drawing. The artist actually calls it a painting. She understands what I mean, but to me, she has drawn in gouache. And I can't determine why I see it as a drawing, but it had to be in this, in this show. From... Um, um, Oh, I just need to read you something that John Berger, I know you'll know, uh, he, he uh, was quite famous in doing The Ways of Seeing, which was a BBC uh, television documentary, and this is a piece that he has written about drawing. Image making begins with interrogating appearances and making marks. Every artist discovers that drawing, when not, when it is an urgent, urgent activity, is a two-way process. To draw is not only to measure and put down, but it's also to receive. When the intensity of looking reaches a certain degree, one becomes aware of an equally intense energy coming towards one through the appearance of whatever it is one is scrutinising. Giacometti's work, life's work is a demonstration. <clears throat> the, the encounter of these two energies, their dialogue, does not have the form of question and answer. It's a for it's a ferocious and inarticulate dialogue. To sustain it requires faith. It's like burrowing into the dark, burrowing under the apparent. The great images occur when two tunnels meet and join perfectly. Sometimes the dialogue is swift, sometimes instantaneous. It's like something thrown and caught. I offer no explanation for this experience. I simply believe very few artists will deny it. It's a professional secret. 
also from that book, which was um, uh, an exhibition uh, called The Bottom Line, drawing can be executed on any type of support um, that, ling that is linguistically founded. It's an index that marks feeling and thought. Drawings old, older than any artist, any museum, any teaching, or any theory. And it can be defined, they believe, the, 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 the people who, uh, uh, actually Philippe von Cotteren and uh, Martin Germain, believe it's defined as the nucleus of culture. Each line marks an impulse to externalise an image, the will to represent it. There's lots of words about drawing, spontaneity, speculation. Fran, who, who did those two text drawings, says, far beyond being a preparatory tool of other disciplines, drawing arguably connects, if not subsumes them all. When trying to pin down a drawing today, the question isn't what, at what point the drawn line becomes the sculpture or the painting or a building, but at what point these products of the human hand are ever not a drawing. Drawing is being exposed as the visualisation of thought. <clears throat> and part of the fascination is that a drawing can be as worked and complete as any three-dimensional piece of artwork or as non-finito as any scratch. Yet with drawing, neither is deemed more or less valuable than the other. <clears throat> what drawing does is not mirror what exists, but it realises it. If it's a subcategory of larger collectivity of objects, events and states of affairs, we refer to it as a work, works of art. It must be allowed to have the least restrictive definition as possible. Uh, that's Michael Archer from the credit there. And then the other statement I like is, drawing is an activity that exemplifies an, an imagination in flux. So what is it? Drawing is simultaneously fundamental and yet peripheral. It's central and yet it's subsidiary to everything else. Why is it so questioned? And it constantly uh, engages intellectuals about the, the notion of drawing and its roles in human communication. There have been many important, important drawing shows. Uh, drawing Now in 1976 at MoMA in New York, Primacy of Drawing in 1991 in UK, Al Allegories of Modernism, Contemporary Drawing again at MoMA, Drawing the Line in 1995 UK, The Stage of Drawing, Gesture and Act at Tate in 2003, Drawing Now, Eight Propositions at MoMA again, the bottom line, the one I was telling you about in Belgium in 2015, the drawing room actually at Deakin University here in March this year. And now I'm proud to bring this show into that mix. Stephen Farthing, who's talking um, actually in one of the videos that we have at the back, he's an artist, he was professor of drawing at UAL. <coughs> um, he says the best drawings create a sense of limbo, a conceptual space it's where ideas can be so stored in an untraceable state, information that just sits there and doesn't go away. All good? <laughs> good, good. <laughs> I hope I've depicted a fresh context in which to think about drawing and illuminate a little bit more on how some artists approach their drawing practice. Okay, we're going to the British uh, Museum. This is the Prints and Drawing Room. The Department of Prints and Drawings uh, contains the National Collection of Western, and I must say, this talk and this show and the work that I studied in Britain did solely uh, focus on Western drawing because Eastern drawing and uh, Persian drawing, etc., has actually a different history. So I do want to qualify that. <clears throat> in the same way that National Gallery and Tate hold the National Collection of Paintings, the British Museum hold drawings. It's one of the top three collections of its kind in the world. There are approximately 50,000 drawings and over 2 million prints dating from the beginning of the 15th century up to present day. You can go in there, you just request any drawing through their online database and the work will be brought out just for you 
and you can sit and stare at it or draw from it. I did that and I requested a Michelangelo, a Dura and some Edward Burns Jones, a Vijay Chalmans and they just bring them out and you sit there with the drawing. It's awe-inspiring. This is one of Edward Burns Jones' uh, drawings that I adore. I do like hair, as you can see by a number of my drawings. Um, what I didn't expect in the copying of these drawings was that there's my copy, to become so intimately tied to their minds as I emulated their mark. I'd always seen copying works as being a sort of strange thing to do, but to go through the process of how they made decisions and why was extremely um, intimate. This is me sitting there drawing. There's the original and there's my copy. Uh, the original close-up, another Edward Burns Jones, part of the uh, Briar Rose series, his working sketches. This is um, what I did from that. I do just want to let you know that the background had been pre-prepared with uh, ink and watercolour. You're not allowed to take anything other than a pencil and an eraser. And a couple of months prior to my arrival, someone had done a little ink addition to a Lotrec. So anything other than a pencil um, is banned. <laughs> I sat there with a Dura and I just, a Dura I had never seen. I apologise for the, that's the uh, window, the skylights in the uh, room which reflect some drawings. They do have uh, a little acetate sheet over the top so in case you sneeze or cough you don't get anything uh, on them. This is the Michelangelo <laughs> that I sat with. To inspect such a thing was completely awe-inspiring. Seriously, it was one of the most intimate things I've done with an artist that I've never met. And I thoroughly recommend if you get the chance. It's online and I can tell if anyone is interested, to, you can just email me from my website and I'm very happy to send you the link if you're going to London. So my website's joelane.com. That is the drawing that I did. Oh, the one on the left, yes, your left, that was actually on the back of, the, uh, of that drawing. And that's Michelangelo's, they think, uh, drawing of an ideal human. My pathetic attempt at his drawing. Segue to now, racing right ahead. This is uh, the drawing, uh, a drawing fair I went to in Paris. It happens every year. It's called Drawing Now. This was the queue waiting to get in before opening time, day one. Cold, waiting, before 9am, Paris, get in to see drawing. I was gobsmacked. I didn't think I'd have to queue. Their definition, the people who organise this fair, um, of drawing doesn't limit itself at all to a sheet of paper. It's a wall drawing, a video, 3D, digital performance. And during each edition of the fair, the line and the sketch and the gesture are represented and celebrated. This year, the year I went in, there were 72 international galleries that showed works. I'm going to show you some of them. It's the 13th year and it's on again in March uh, 2019, 28th to the 31st at the Carreau de Temple, same place. And if you're going to Paris, go. <laughs> Um, I'm going to show you some of my favourite works and I do apologise, some of them aren't credited because I walked in, it was just alive with ideas and I was snapping and documenting and a few I did miss, the actual artist. That's inside the building, as are many buildings in Paris, just cavernous and wonderful. This is a special mention of uh, um, uh, an artist I fell in love with. That's about two metres wide. He, uh, Klaus Mosetig is his name, he's Austrian. He works, his works are about appropriation. He took a drawing his three-year-old had done in texture and he blew it up and he redrew it in pencil and uh, mounted it uh, without glass as well, which I also like because of the relationship with the drawing. And it was the most awesome piece of, 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 of appropriation I had seen. And it was vibrant and alive and it was so twombly, but it was abstract. And this three-year-old had done it. Then putting it into a different context, I found just awesome. This is a work that he did. Um, this is a tabletop, also two metres tall. The tabletop of where refugees entered Greece and they had to meet authorities. 
it's a huge drawing. Um, they put their fingerprints on paper as they lined up trying to enter Greece in this uh, one of the latter uh, refugee influxes into Europe. The tables become worn and scratched and battered. It was an extraordinary drawing. He, all, he mounted it to board again without glass and the gallerist was so generous with his time because I spent probably an hour with him. He knew I wasn't a buyer and to just go through how he did it and why and what the process was. This is a close up. You can see the sheen on the graphite. Um, and again, I just thought it was the most, it had meaning, it had, it, had, it had joy, it had sorrow. I don't know if you agree, but I was, anyway, I have since written to Thomas and told him how much I just um, think his work is so, it's very, very special. This is Akiki Smith. I was very honoured to stand in front of Akiki Smith drawing. Uh, she's one of my... Oh, of many idols. I, I love her work and again I apologise, there's a lot of skylights in Europe, the reflection on the glass uh, chose that position. But this, this Kiki Smith drawing was also about life size and it was 125,000 euro. <clears throat> this is a drawing, apologies to the artist. He had drawn over every, and it was a he, I do remember that, every single page he had obliterated the text with graphite. Is it a sculpture? Is it a drawing? What is it? Same thing with this. I also just love this. They, they, he had got uh, newspapers and made those marks over the text. This is a woman called Katrin Strobel. She had found an old mirror. She painted the mirror and then scratched out the drawing into the mirror so one could immerse oneself somehow it was a very powerful right it reminded me a little of a Kiki Smith but I found it incredibly powerful again very difficult to photograph beautiful drawings this is um, by Sophie Kujikin she had made plaster she gessoed plaster and then used silver point over the the gesso gentle beautiful it felt old but contemporary Apologies to the artist. I thought this was this is a very large piece of work. Again, I love the the primacy of the, of the drawn gesture there. Drawing over photography. This is Sam Kaprielov. Two huge classic charcoal drawings, which I thought had wonderful energy and adored. Can't find his name. He would, uh, and I do apologise. We do follow each other on Instagram, and I couldn't find it for this talk. But he does drawings inside of book covers, and displayed uh, on the wall. I found them just fantastic too. This is Richard Muller. Um, they, don't, they do remind me a little bit of Desper's work that you'll see at the back when you look at the exhibition. Uh, close up, it's these t lot of tiny, tiny little marks to create that, to cr create that work. I attended some talks there at uh, the fair, one particular with Kate McFarlane, who's the co-director of the Drawing Room, which is in London, uh, Michelle White, senior curator of the Menel Collection in Houston, Texas, and Brett Lippman, who's the executive director of the Drawing Centre in New York. I'll come back to the drawing room in London, but I did want to um, just impart with you a couple of things that the other two said. Uh, <coughs> Michelle White of the Menel Collection. The Menels are a family in Texas who wanted to start their own art museum uh, with their wealth. And they decided to just collect drawings. And they found one of the reasons they loved it was because for their million dollars, they could get an enormous number of works that they felt had the same importance as spending 150000 on one painting. So they, they will celebrate drawing. It's open next year in Houston, the Menel Collection, and they will go on through uh, their journey of their own museum to consolidate a contemporary drawing collection. Brett Lippmann, who's the, the director, executive director of the Drawing Centre in New York, divulged to us that when he took the job seven years ago, he thought mm, secretly, oh, I think it's probably only, probably only interests me for about a year, so many drawings. He's been there seven years and he said every single day 
he finds it more and more interesting. He's completely absorbed and hadn't really understood the complexity of what was on offer with drawings. So I thought that was quite interesting. He'd come from MoMA and took that job. I thought it was actually quite brave of him to tell us that too. In Paris, there's a drawing hotel. <laughs> you can stay there, obviously. And there are uh, drawings throughout the, um, this is actually Emma, one of my best friends from uni, standing in front, uh, throughout the rooms and the hallways. And downstairs, they have a drawing lab and uh, open to the public. This is uh, Gail Chotard, and she does uh, drawings with wire and shadows. And this was called um, an installation in situ. And there's one of her little pen drawings with her um, sculptures on the wall. But the shadows were very much part of the drawing. Um, I could go on and on about the exhibitions. I saw Richard Serra at Gagosian, uh, Glenn Brown, who who's, who's, um, appropriates old masters but in a new drawn way. Um, I've had actually had two of my works selected for two prestigious art prizes, which I was incredibly proud of. But they weren't drawing prizes, they were art prizes. It's not seen as anything different. It's, not, it's, not, uh, it's, just, it's just one genre amongst many. I put the images of that at the end if anyone's interested, but we'll, we'll go on. This, this is um, the Drawing Room London, devoted to drawing, to its research as a library, to residencies and showing drawing. This particular drawing um, is a ma by a man called David Haynes and it's called Your Fluffer and it's pencil on paper. Um, the show that this was from was called A Slice Through the World. That drawing, even though it looks pixelated at the back, is in fact entirely drawn in pencil and is, he drew the pixels as well as drawing the computers in front of him. <coughs> Every part of it. And he, he spoke about his fashion, fascination with the digital world um, and the pixelation of unknown people beyond the screen. While I did sense he had had relationships with people through the screen, um, he also discussed the nature of pixels and the atom that is graphite. He said, when you blow up a digital image, it will always end up being just a pixel, an electronic signal without meaning and no connection to the world or matter. But no matter how much you blow up a drawing, you still have matter, <laughs> you still have atomic matter, you have a graphite atom, you have a piece of paper fibre, and it's a piece of material, it's an element. And it was something that I just thought was a lovely concept and made me um, the visceral nature of what a drawing is and its connection to, uh, to, to sort of groundedness. Um, it's a sort of clear and honest. That brings me to graphite, actually. <laughs> Um, I call this the Church of the Pencil. I was um, invited to go to a pencil factory in Portugal. Uh, it's just out of Porto, uh, called Viaco. Uh, makes the most beautiful products. Um, there is a distributor in Australia, which is how I got the connection. And I saw how pencils were made, and this has not changed for hundreds and hundreds of years. <clears throat> and graphite is carbon, by the way, um, and a few million years later, it can become a diamond. It's actually a, a, in the Natural History Museum in London, there is, in the foyer, there's a, a graphite to diamond uh, example of each element. It's just like, oh yes, diamonds. <laughs> so, um, Modern pencils and old pencils are made up of these items. It's powdered graphite, which Viaco happened to get from a mine in Germany, um, and clay. And the various percentages of those two combinations make up B, B and H, and HB. So H is for hard, more clay, B is for black, more graphite. And then right at the end of the Bs, the eight Bs, the, uh, they add a bit of charcoal to get even more black because graphite will shine when the atoms are, 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 are moved in the same direction. As you'll see from my drawings, as the light sheens, they, they do align. And as soon as you add 
charcoal, it sucks the light in. So that's where the bees come from. So they're, they're the elements that... Um, uh, that, that thing on the right, the very right-hand side, that sort of looks like a hat thing at the back there, that's a, like a, a canvas crucible. Uh, the the, the uh, graphite and the clay is put into that crucible and water is dripped through it over 24 hours until you end up with this hard, beautiful piece of silvery substance called graphite that is then uh, baked like ceramics, um, highly energy intensive. It's something like 600 degrees for eight hours, then uh, another four hours at 1,000 degrees to make the stuff that's in your pencil. They are then uh, cut into uh, cylinders and then sandwiched between two pieces of timber. He uses cedar from America and uh, by hand they cut off the little bits that stick out the end. With this machine uh, they roll it over the cedar, you can see the little t teeth, and that then will cut one side uh, um, of the cedar out, they turn it over and then cut the other side, ending up with this little cylinder. So there is a, a glue factor between the two sandwiched I just thought, it was, thank you for smiling, I just thought it was this most fascinating process, this um, of, of learning how a pencil was made. Many pencils, many, many, as with everything, are made in China now, so it's quite rare to be able to sit inside a, a pencil factory that will do small runs. Um, and of course, there's, then they, they, they uh, paint the, the ends, they dip it in, and then they stack them in these, again, wonderful, I think, pieces of artwork, these stacks of pencils. And that's Jose at the back, who is passionate about pencils, as I am, and um, who showed me through. Okay, uh, a few more notes. Nearly to the end. Thank you all for <coughs> back to drawing. Mm. I'd like to say a few words about this show. <coughs> As Steinhardt, who's an author uh, in a book in um, that he wrote in two thousand and four, called um, it's called the Undressed Art: Why We Draw. And he says, I guess many children who can contrive to draw realistic do so because there's something in the world they have an intense interest in. Something that's not shared enough by those around them to be the subject of conversation, so it's something they get to know privately. I understand this to be, uh, to align to my own private fascination with observation and the intense desire to draw the subject of that observation. He goes on, Steinhardt goes on to outline John Ruskin's, uh, who I hope you know of, a, a wonderful English uh, intellect drawer patron. Um, in fact, one of the wonderful things John Ruskin did was drew many of the gargoyles and architectural features in Venice. And with pollution and, and uh, weather, of course, they're wearing away. So there's this beautiful document, documentation of those, but a beautiful drawer of nature. <coughs> um, he had a very stern upbringing and he was alone very often. And Ruskin observed nature, seeing it as a set of connections to deeper powers and mysteries. And before he was 10, he was drawing it. He quotes Ruskin saying, his entire delight had been observing without myself being noticed. While necessarily in a social context when drawing depictions of people, I too like not being noticed. <clears throat> I find the front gaze too disconcerting and prefer to observe and have a preference to draw people from behind. I'm able to express my own wonder and ponder the wonder of others without being scrutinised by them. I scrutinise the elements of my subjects, I draw and I decide what's in and what's out privately. I obviate the elements that mean more to me than maybe them. I observe minutely and I portray the pleasure that I find in that and I'm the unobserved, unobserved observer. It's the opposite of traditional portraiture, uh, where the front gauge, uh, gaze is paramount, and it's the flip side. 
Uh, back to Dr. Winnicott, uh, the British psychoanalyst, he places some artistic motivation in the tension between the desire to hide and the desire to communicate. My drawings particularly are from this fissure between the private refuge of my work and, this, and studio and the public engagement. <coughs> the works you see behind me and around are my way only and actually one thing I will say about the master's program at UAL, there, there was no doctrine about what drawing was or how to draw or what to draw. They said, we are here to help you be the best you you can be. So I did love that. There's no movement that they're trying to get you to um, follow. Uh, the, there is only the discover, discovery of the interiority of what you want to communicate. Um, this was my way of trying to articulate self and other and this is part of an, th what you see a part of an installation and I called it about face, uh, return, referring to turning around in the military sense but also the fact that there is no face. My investigation was into the difference between being inside oneself and looking out to the other and how different those states are and where does empathy fit in and how to translate this notion in a complex um, activity as drawing. And this was actually my final master's project. I do find that, you, for me, drawing says a lot more, and I can say it in a more complex way than words, and it's how I, partic how I speak uh, is through drawing. I used the draped head here, made of plaster, I consider to be a drawing, to signify our difficulty in really seeing except ourselves. Um, every person that I draw, um, I ask them if I can. I show them my work. I often go up to strangers and ask if I can draw the backs of their heads and their hair. I align hair to a physical metaphor of thinking. So we think inside our heads, but this fibre comes from our heads. So I enjoy that metaphor. I show them my work and I ask them to sit for me or if I can take photos. And in this way, I make a connection and an interchange of dual appreciation takes place between strangers. And for me, that's as much part of the process, actually, as the drawing, how to connect to people. These are just other installations. I curved the wall because I wanted people to come in and have a slight disquiet as to why things weren't square. I used photography uh, also in my, in my uh, work and made that uh, installation. More about this show that I hope you will have a chance to look at. I adored putting together this lot of works. It sings to me. Some of the artists are here, um, and you're welcome to chat to them before I introduce them. Sorry, guys. Um, I would like to finish on a quote, and I hope there's some questions, but i um, happy if there isn't, but I would love some if I've spurred any uh, thinking around what drawing is. Avis Newman, who was um, the professor at drawing, actually for the Centre for Drawing at the University of Arts between 2006 and 2009. I must say that the drawing program at Bath Spa University and UAL has been mostly driven by passionate women who adore drawing. And there's a thing called Draw, uh, Drawing Research at Wimbledon. Um, and it's constantly being uh, revised, uh, contributed to, discussed, exhibited. Um, Avis Newman is an extraordinary person. Uh, as, she, as I said, she was at Wimbledon. And she says about viewing drawings when she discussed with uh, Catherine de Zegger, who's the international curator of um, a show at Tate Collection called The Stage of Drawing, Gesture and Act. <coughs> um, she says, Drawing is an act of scrutiny. The act of looking at drawings with scrutiny is also automatically invited. The scrutiny can only match the scrutiny with which one has employed in the interiority of the drawing process. She also says, when we look, 
we enter the intimate space of a work that is as close to the action of an artist's thought as one can get. And I think what greater gift can one, can one give to another than that? I've finished now, lots of words, I do apologise, thank you. <laughs>